Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the show. It's me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 274 of the Agostino Zinger Show. That's dos siete cuatro. Dos siete cuatro. Yes. También. También, también. Oh, um, no también. Um, ¿Qué tal? Mi amigos, mi, uh, mi amigos, mi, mi amigos y mi amigas, right? Is that how you say it? Something along those kind of lines? I don't know who I'm looking at, but I'm trying to get some help from, but no one else is help from, but no one else is here. I'm here on my own, watching you directly through this lovely webcam. Hope you guys are well. Hope you guys are safe, right? You're good? As per usual, at top of the show, just wanted to let you guys know if it's your first time tuning into the Axiom Zinger Show, this is the number one, the one, the only the nationwide favorite, the globe's favorite. You know, all people love my show. It's number one rated streetwear show in the world. Most of the news I cover is concerning the streetwear universe, which I tend to deem as hip hop music or hip hop music, music, hip hop, whatever it may be, right? Art, design, fashion, uh, culture, electronic dance music, all that nice, good stuff that you partake in in the scene. It's all underneath this one umbrella called the Agassino Zinger Show. Obviously, I stream this via YouTube now. If you're watching Premiere on YouTube, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think of the show. If you're listening via the podcast app, you know what to do. Leave me a five-star review. And if you want to come back again to watch this on video, smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, and you can come back again and tune in, innit? Right? 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 Good. Amazing. So, so much to jump into, so much to get in involved in. As you can tell from the tone or from the from the kind of you know resolution of the camera and where i am right now is some time after work so i've kind of raced back home to do this podcast before the man united game kicks off which kind of dates the podcast somewhat but who cares but regardless i'm gonna go through some topics that i have specked out jump around a bit a fair bit because i've got some stuff i need to get um on top of that i haven't commented on for a while and then we're gonna take it from there in it right we're gonna take it from there so what I want to talk about, um, let's go through the list of things I want to get involved with straight away. Let's see what I've got here. Got so much stuff to get involved with. Let's see what I want to do first. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, so let's go through from let's go from top to bottom actually. So um Dick Mantle have put out their list or the lineup for the 2020 festival. I'm not sure if you guys are a big fan of Dick Mantle. I am. I'm always obsessing over the videos that you see online, especially from Boiler Room. There's some legendary Boiler Room videos from Dick Mantle. One of my favorites being the Ben Clock set. Um, you know, I think you're all familiar with who Ben Clock is and his kind of, you know, he's kind of uh, start, you know, being a Bergheim resident and his kind of history. But it's great to see it in kind of, you know, full HD or in in his kind of full element when he's at Dick Mantle. I think that was kind of the set that kind of, again, brought attention to him. I'm a big fan of the Motor City Drum Ensemble set. Actually, I'm going to get that up now at the moment. Let me quickly get this up too from Dick Mantle. That was a really prominent moment. And throughout the whole time of me just being a fan of Boiler Room, I've always been, you know, you're, you're familiar with seeing the setting, you know, the shelter, that stage where they usually have Boiler Room uh, streaming their kind of set from there. And just in general, it's just been a great, a great place to kind of, you know, be engrossed in dance music and obviously get the opportunity to see loads of different people play at the same time. This is the kind of quintessential set that I remember from, uh, I remember watching from uh, so Mozart Dome, some of uh, one of my favorite DJs from back in the day, or so still from now, I say my ex a while. This is a legendary set from Deck Mantle. I'm going to quickly just forward it around a bit. And you know, you probably know that you do Drum Ensemble, a real amazing house DJ, plays a mixture of vinyl and digital tracks, usually using a rotary mixer. Just a, an expert mixer, an expert song selector, and it's a killer DJ all around. And I remember watching this for the first time thinking, wow, man, this guy is really fucking good at DJ, you know? And also just being a fan of the vibe. Um, I think that's the one thing you see about Deck Mantle when you're actually watching it via the stream is that it seems like a great it seems like a good fun night to be at right right so for the most part it's not somewhere that you'd want to be at like you'd want to go and hang out there let me pause this so i don't have too much noise playing in the background it seems like a fun place to be so i've always had the, uh, the kind of urge to go there myself but this year unfortunately we can't go i think the dates don't really fall in line and i think for the most part we're going to be spending most of our festival season in junction two then it might be a brief occasion where I might go out to Innovision's uh, night that they do when um, Sonar's on. Is it Sonar? Is it Sonar? Or is it... Which one is it in Barcelona? Is it Sonar? 
I think it's Sona, right? Innervision, is it? Innervision Barcelona. Let me quickly check this up. Because that's where I'm going to, I think. So I don't think that's why it doesn't fall at the right times, right? So let's go Innervision. Yeah, so Innervision Barcelona is during... I'm sure it's Sona Festival, isn't it? I'm pretty sure it's Sona. But it's up, it's up on here on um, Resident Advisor already. I think they're selling tickets for this already now. So on the 21st of June. And then Deck Mantle 2020, I'm pretty sure is around the same time. Let's see the dates here. Da, 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 da. Dick Mantle announces lineup for the 2020 festival. And I think it's around the same sort. Yeah, 29th of July. And then Junction 2, I'm sure, is around the same. So it's, there's a lot of festivals at the same time. A lot of money is going to go towards giving people these fest um giving these organizers um the entry money for these festivals. It's just going to be a bit too tight. Yeah, looking at the list. So you've got. I've got here on my screen just to kind of show you what I'm talking about. So, Innovisions Barcelona is on the 21st of June 2020. And then Deck Mantle is on the 29th. And then you've got Junction 2 on the 5th. So, there's a lot of things happening at the same time. So, I'm not really sure if I'm going to be able to kind of work it all in at the same time, innit? Right? So, it is what it is. But anyway, Deck Mantle put out their lineup and it looks pretty solid, to be fair. Um, I think there's a lot of people on there that I'm sure a lot of my listeners will be a big fan of. Let me get up the list quickly here. I can find it. Where is it? There we go. So they put the lineup out. And to be honest, it looks amazing. Right? This is an article from Resident Advisor. Uh, talking about the festivals is the following. Dick Mantle announces the lineup for 2020 festival. The eighth edition of the world placed of the what sorry of the world love the Amsterdam event includes Front Two Four Two, which will be amazing. If you're a big fan of um, EBM electronic body music, you'll you'll love that. I think that's going to be a good good show to see them play live. I'm sure it, I'm sure it'll be a live show. I don't know whether or not there's some members of Front Twenty of Front Two Four Two who play who just DJ. Maybe that would be the thing, or maybe they'll use a whole live setup with modular synths and shit. And all that malarkey that would be pretty cool um so um so we've got front 242 fear parish lorraine james and venetian snares the asks is the following documental return to amsterdam bows from july 29th until the august 2nd i remember seeing a vlog of a couple people that went to deck mantle and supposedly the game is that you um get accommodation in the city center and you like cycle out to the site where deck mantle is i'm sure it's, it's like a little park just outside of Amsterdam or something like that. It's not too far to cycle there. People do that all the time. Um, and I'm sure people go there every year. So most of the good accommodation that you'd want closer to the venue is probably sold out or booked out months in advance, probably ahead of time, because I'm sure they have the same dates rolling year after year, or most likely they already announced that the next year's dates, you know, this year, because they know it's going to sell out. They know they're going to have a good reception. A good amount of people are going to buy tickets on the pre sale and all that stuff. So, um, now in its eighth year, the Dutch institution has booked an array of returning and emerging talents, along with some valued, uh, sorry, so voted legendary acts. Fear Parish will play a 10-hour DJ set. That's nuts. That should be flipping fun. Um, they've got the likes of Philip Glass playing. They've got S, I don't know how you pronounce that name. Uh, you've got Floating Points. You've got Robert Hood, Object Blue, Karen, Giant Swan, Air Max 97, The Bridge, Object, Ezra Miller. Oh, Ezra Miller, is that Ezra Miller from... No, it's not Ezra Miller from Vampire Weekend. Who's, who am I thinking about? Who's Ezra? Hmm. Um, Lauren Halo's playing. Other DJs include Harv... DJ Harvey's playing. That should be fun. I, I, I already told you about my experience seeing DJ Harvey play at Lovebox, you know, Ministry of Sound, um, Metropolis, uh, Bergheim. The Bergheim and the parents was probably my favourite. Because, again, if you know anything about Bergheim and Paranormal Bar, you would assume... You would have probably more likely to have seen DJ Harvey play upstairs at Panorama Bar. But instead he played the main floor in the Bergheim and he absolutely tore it to pieces. But I shouldn't be surprised, right? If you're 20 plus years into DJing, you're going to be able to do just about anything you want. Right? You're going to be able to tear up, a, you know, any scene, any scenario, any setting for the most part. You probably could do a good enough job to get people dancing. So I wouldn't, shouldn't be too surprised, but it was a magical set to see all these like, you know, um leather clad club kids who are waiting for boom 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 stuff to see them dancing and raving and getting crazy to dj harvey on the main floor was great to see see him smiling behind a booth and really thankful for the good vibes on the dance floor was great to see as well just so awesome so that should be fun uh honey as well another big dj that i'm a big fan of um booked for deck mantles techno oriented ufo stage that should be cool to see honey play techno dj ez is great legendary london legendary uk dj who i'm sure most of you are aware of 
his absolutely insane mixing ability, right? His ability to kind of chop, layer, drop in the most, you know, obscure shit and also the stuff that you would kind of, you know, harken back to when you were younger. Just an absolutely stellar DJ. Somebody that I would, you know, be happy to book for my wedding one day. Um, an absolute, uh, you know, bad man on the behind the decks. Obviously, DJ Stingray. Uh, you got Sherelle Sh- playing, who's had a really amazing year in it. Cheryl, Cheryl, how you pronounce her name? Um, from you know, from the from the pull up gate until now, she's had a really amazing year. It's kind of gone from success after success. I think I recently saw a tweet something about she quit her full time job or part time job to go full time DJing, which is must be a dream come true for someone like that. You know, what I mean, grinding, doing your thing on the scene, and then eventually you get to a point where you're able to sustain yourself uh, by just playing the music that you love with around your friends, all that stuff. That must just be so, so cool. I'm so jealous. So um, well done to her. That's awesome. Lorraine James, I mentioned before, Josie Rebel, of course, you know from, if you're in the UK, you know that she's one of our uh, better DJs out there in the scene right now. Uh, better Libra, Hype 11E, Up Sammy, who I'm very, I'm very fond of. I think she's Dutch. I think she's a resident at this school, but I've heard a few of her mixes and she's really good, quite housey. Um, there is a there, she can get deep and a bit dark when she wants to, but again, a very underrated DJ on the scene right now. And I think someone who might have a big 2020 coming up, so keep your eye up, eye up for up Sammy. And same with Nazira, but I think Nazira had a big 2011 as well, 2019. Sorry, so I think she's probably going to follow the same sort of route that Cheryl would follow, just one needs one breakout, I mean, which is funny with Cheryl thing, right? Because I'm sure at that moment. It wasn't really, it was quite disrespectful what happened with the whole pull-up thing. You don't know the guy, he's pulling up your tune. You know, there's that whole power dynamic, men, women, blah, blah, blah. You know, don't get into that nonsense because it's not, nothing, not my bag. And I think it was overblown to some extent. But I do think the idea of something you don't know pulling up your track is a bit of a piss take. Don't get me wrong. But it's funny how something so negative has essentially led to her, you know, her kind of popping and blowing up overnight. And again, I'm sure she would have blown up anyway because I'm sure her boiler room set got mad views regardless of the pull up thing. But I'm sure that didn't didn't um that didn't hurt. Do you know what I mean to have that bit of controversy? Because then she did kind of regain form and sort of like regained her composure and still you know duppy the dance um after that incident occurred. So <laughs> Nazira probably needs one of those situations to occur. You don't you're not kind of wishing some stranger's gonna go out of her decks and pull up the record, but something like those lines will probably help her get up to the other to the other side and then you got a back-to-back sets with jess and lojack lena wilkins and vladimir Izikov, which i'm sure sorry lena wilkins and vladimir whatever his name is the residents from club divisionaire that should be fun uh zakiria no i don't know who that is and ski mask and steny ski mask i saw at london i saw a mix actually that was a good night um so again front 22 a japanese interpreter brand goat Venetian snares and da, 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 da. so really good lineup man of people there i think there's tickets available now or did the pre-sale sell out already i'm not too sure i think there was pre no there's pre sale out at the moment because i'm sure someone from the london techno group that I'm a, I'm a part of on whatsapp messages that they had pre-sale tickets so if you're able to find someone that's able that's got a pre-sale code and they can get you in the door then please do the man it looks like fun it was like a festival I'd love to go to. Again, I'm not too sure about dates because I've got so much stuff I'm going to at the moment. Junction, Innovisions and Barcelona. I maybe should go to Dick Manchester kind of mix things up again, but I would like to go to Amsterdam uh, outside the festival scene just to kind of experience the city. It's been a place that I've been kind of longing to go to for a long, long time. And I don't really think the first time should be a festival occasion. But again, as one of the, you know, they're easily one of the most, you know, storied, and legendary and really successful and diverse and just fun festivals out there from the looks of it i I said i checked out some vlogs online on youtube and it looks like a whole lot of fun so i'm sure those of you who are aware of that might know this already but if you're not definitely get on it and try and get a ticket if you're that way inclined from the 29th of july to 2nd of august again it's probably a lot more it's going to work out a lot cheaper than stuff that you attend in london you get you get to go on a trip to amsterdam with your friends smoke something eat something nice have a little dance and come back home no biggie no biggie so let's move on from that one what else we got to talk about here um let's talk about best raves i've been to actually that might be good best raves yeah because i've got i've got my little um thing here i was looking at my ra and i was checking all my events i've been to i've been to quite a few good events um this or last year actually so tom let me just go through some of my top events that i went to in 2019 right so raves from january 2019 to december 2019 
and they're all on my kind of RA of my tickets things. You can see on the screen. So I'm just going to quickly just scan through some stuff that I thought was of interest. So, um, what's a good thing I thought was great that I went to? What's the first rave I went to in 2019? Oh, Origin, Steffi at Mixed Garage. That was great. And um, again, Origins put on probably one of the best nights out at the thing at the moment. Um, I don't think they can be contested for the most part in terms of promotion, in terms of who they get. <coughs> it's a fairly safe kind of format they usually have a couple residents who they kind of have in house playing beforehand and then they have a big stellar act that you would have known or heard of um you know shelling for the most of the kind of peak hours between the hours of like 12 and 4 a.m and again mix being just around the corner from where i live it's um just so it's, it's it's kind of situated within these little warehouses around hackney wick if you're familiar with the crate you'll know where that area is so it's not too far from there and again i can walk home pretty quickly i can get uber pretty quickly so just a perfect zone for me to be around right um so do we have a no no one has a video actually is it, this is peach playing there so yeah we don't I, I don't have a video at the moment i think this is a video of peach playing at mix actually and it's pretty cool i put it up to show you what it looks like so essentially this is i've got mixy on the screen for those of you watching via youtube and you've got essentially it's like a it's it, i think it doubles up as a warehouse for like beer local beer that gets served in the bars around i'm sure they have the beer i'm pretty sure i've seen crate um mixed garage brewed beer in the crate that little kind of pub bit with the pieces and stuff i'm pretty sure um so they've got this mat it's like a big kind of warehousey sort of space right it's got like a mezzanine like sort of thing at the at the back where the just uh, just over the bar then at the front where the dj is meant to be at that's where they kind of put all the pallets with the beer kegs and stuff but i'm sure during the day the entire dance floor is made is built up of kegs and stuff but they kind of clear it before you come there and then of course they've got usually some kind of cool lighting that happens around the dj i think when we went to see tricks play um late last year they had a real big setup involved in lighting they got someone to come in and do the whole you know lights and stuff and it was flipping insane but usually the lighting setup is pretty cool and i think by and large i try to stand as close as i can to the speakers at the front and just get really crazy get really mental and have a good time and as you can see here this is peach playing at oranges as well shelling it down was actually was peach playing as a she might have been a, a, a flipping um warm-up actually do i remember that bloody hell it's so long ago uh no it wasn't it was token playing with the peach um sorry with Steffi but that was that was origin so that was a fun night I remember that being quite fun you can see here from the front of the booth DJ actually tearing it up I said peach is like PC music is peach PC music I'm not too sure I forgot yeah this set looks pretty fun so that was that that looked like a fun occasion again I didn't go to that but I went to see Steffi Again, one of my favorite um, DJs out. I think, do you, do you remember Steffi? Steffi's one of my favorite. I remember she, do you remember this song? Um, uh, Steffi, yours, you remember that? That was my kind of go-to from back in the day. Um, one of the first sort of like, you know, tech house tunes that I kind of played to the end. Would you, would you call it tech house? I think you would call it tech house, wouldn't you, right? Do you remember this? That was a big tune. Anyway, yeah, so Steffi was awesome at Mix. I remember that that was a good occasion. And uh, let me go back to the list again, see what else I want to call. Oh, one of my maybe standout sets. I want to probably do only a couple more now. I just don't want to bore you with all my raving exploits. But one of the standout um, sets that I went to go see, or standout raves actually, in terms of overall production and what they did, has to be, has to be, has to be, has to be uh, Nina Kravitz at the Wolverstow Assembly Hall right it's for a night called retexture which is which was a festival thing that the crank brothers put on um it was in different venues around london different djs playing at different sort of times loads of big acts but i went to see nina kravitz because i'm a big fan of hers and she's a you know one of the ogs in the game uh let me see if i can find it here wolf and stuff so i remember seeing because i'm again i'm always on resident advisor i'm always checking things out and uh, wolf and Star assembly hall let me see what? No one, no one's got it, huh? Huh? No one's got a video of her playing at Retextured. Interesting. Prodigy, what? Really? No one's got any videos of her playing there. Okay, fair enough. Let me see if I can find out a video. Retextured. Let me see. No one, no one's got a video of her. I'm just looking at Instagram, see if anyone's got a video of her playing at Retextured, but I guess not Retextured. There were people taking videos. It wasn't like they covered our cameras or anything. 
So that's interesting. But anyway, who cares? So, Wolverstow Assembly Hall is this amazing uh, venue just near me, of course. Um, and I'm not sure what it was formerly, if it's a kind of theatre or whatever it is, but it's flipping gigantic, right? It looks like it should have a swimming pool in it. I'm going to try and get up here on the screen to show you what they did, right? So, big up Crank Brothers for investing that kind of money and getting that place hired and stuff, because I'm sure it wasn't cheap. So, it's a town hall, essentially. Uh, it's based in uh, Wolverhampton. I'm going to get the images up over here now. And it's really, really big, right? So, I had to get... I kind of rocked up there, I think, just before the opening, just because I didn't want to... I wanted to make sure that I was getting in at first, because, again, I bought tickets, but you never know these events sometimes. Like, sometimes they can sometimes oversell the event, and then you end up standing outside waiting for the whole one in one out thing so i didn't want to take any chances so i ended up getting there quite early and i remember just rocking up thinking bloody hell this place is massive there's big gates outside like you're just arriving to buckingham palace and then you have to walk a long way until you get to the actual front of the actual building which is this thing which looks a little bit similar to like the burger so that was quite funny to hear kind of techno blaring out of this massive cube that was you know effectively a place for old fuddy duddies to complain about issues with the local council and stuff right but instead it's been transformed into this kind of you know, haven for techno. Now, before getting in, I have to admit, the security was a bit excessive. You know, they did kind of ruin the vibe for a couple of people. Some people did arrive a bit out of their minds, you know, too drunk, too fucked up. But, you know, that is part of the parcel of going out in London, I think, for the most part. People aren't that... Mat not <sighs> They aren't that we are we're not that cultured. I'm gonna say I'm gonna creep myself. I'm not gonna point fingers. We're not the most cultured people when it comes to going out and having a good time, right? The lack of stamina is something you see a lot, on, especially in some London clubs, right? You see people kind of petering out and leaving places, you know, a couple of hours before the the place is gonna close. But if you go to other places, especially in Europe, you tend to see people, you know, going for it until the lights come on, right, in the venue because they're used to kind of spacing things out a bit better, maybe eating lunch later, maybe eating in the first place, wherever it may be, they're better at kind of tempering the night and making sure they don't peak too early. But when I went there, people did off definitely they peaked way too early. But again, um, that that being said, it was an amazing night. Um, Crank Brothers hired this great venue out. They put a, a bespoke uh, lighting system, a bespoke sound system in there i love the they had this amazing kind of screen behind nina kravitz like it's kind of like i don't know wall to wall width size tight screen it was massive right and essentially it had all these graphics there and it uh i think it was an led screen or whatever it may have been it had graphics and, and words will come up at the back and it also just would have a white light so that you'd see uh, Nina Kravitz's shadow kind of swaying left to right. And if you're familiar with Nina Kravitz, you know how she kind of dances. So that was quite cool to see that kind of thing. This is sort of a, this is not the same video, but this is a video from like Athens, right? Similar-ish kind of, but not really. Mostly as a screen. This looks like people behind standing there, but it was a really, 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 really great night. And again, one of my standout um, raves because again, um, just in terms of being a promoter, I know how much it must have cost them to kind of fit that place out, get security, a full bar. It was a it was a real big undertaking. And for the for most part, it did seem like the punters that went there were really appreciative how much went into the space. The only issue, I think, was the fact that the floor was incredibly slippery. I remember falling over a couple of times, picking myself up, of course, but it was really, really slippery. You did end up getting really... Um, you know, because it was all flipping laminated flooring, wood, you know, old school kind of town hall flooring. I can only imagine what that must have cost to clean up and repair if people were spinning their drinks and making the floor get warped and stuff. So that wasn't too fun. But apart from that, a great time. Um, the only issue is the toilets were like, you know, miles away. You had to kind of go out of the venue, go down some stairs, past the cloakroom, and then you enter the toilets. And the cloakroom as well was, you know, full of people there um but by and large um a great night and a great occasion i think crank brothers again one of our standout promoters out here in london or in the uk for in general so i definitely recommend you check out their parties when they put them on and then i would say what was my last one i've already spoken about mix already haven't i so let's probably change something else let's go to another rave that i thought was good ba -ba 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 -ba. Corsica Studios. That was that was a great. Oh, and Gerd Janssen at Village Underground. That was also pretty cool. But I think a standout, maybe the first one, maybe might be Inferno at the Yard, right? And Inferno is a mostly I'm gonna say it's a queer party for the most part, right? They have a lot of drag acts sometimes performing there. 
um a lot of it's no it's a they provide a safe space for that community so you have to be you know in the know to and to, to really be aware of when their party is happening in the first place but nowadays it feels as if they're like promoting and pushing it a lot more um, i'm sure they've done parties in berlin and other places too they're very much plugged into that community so they know how to put on a good show and by and large i went there on the whim i didn't really know much about inferno and what they do in terms of parties I didn't know much about the performers. I didn't know much about who was DJing. And it was really fun. Maybe one of the funnest times I've had um, going out. Again, the yard is probably one of our better venues, similar to Mix. It's right It's right next to Mix, actually. It's in the same sort of square in Hackney Wick, if you're familiar with the area. Um, and again, a great venue, great security staff, uh, great people that work behind a bar, and just a nice little cozy little spot in the middle of Hackney Wick. It's, you know, it's got this great little kind of covered up, uh, smoking area outside with like seating and stuff you can find out and chill out and make new friends and stuff and then the inside the dance floor it gets hot it gets sweaty and they have the addition of the stage just towards the back of the actual room that people get up on and dance and really kind of go for it and in general just again one of my favorite um kind of carefree nights again i didn't know much about the rave i didn't know much about the people behind it i just went on a whim and i had a hell of a time let's see if i can if someone had a video of them um inferno the yard let's see if anyone had a video from that time that was a couple of months ago wasn't it nah no one's got any videos from that party unfortunately so but yeah i would imagine you wouldn't anyway it was a safe space right you want to be a little bit private let people have their time yeah but yeah i'd imagine if you're a fan of those kind of parties and if you want to be plugged into the queer community into the gay scene into the lgbtq plus scene definitely recommend you check out um it's, I would imagine it's similar to like crossbreed, even though crossbreed is probably more sex positive or whatever that's called, right? That's kind of parties. But it's, sim it's similar in that sort of like sim same sort of family, right? So definitely check them out if you're looking for a safe place to go and shell out, put on your best outfit and go and get a bit weird. It's really good. I really recommend you check it out. So yeah, those are my favorite kind of top performances so far or top nights out actually in London from last year. What are yours? Let me know in the comments below. What was your some of your favorite nights out in London from last year? I'm not I'm not big on the so I'm not big on roundup lists, but I thought it'd be cool just to look back on some fun nights I've had. So let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. Um, talking about fun nights, talking about DJing. There's a really funny article that popped up on my um, social media or my Twitter feed actually that kind of uh, had me saying I knew it on my desk when I was reading it. Right, and this is concerning the one, the only Peggy Goo, who had a very interesting couple of years, isn't it? Right, she came essentially out of nowhere for the most part released a really banging track and kind of went Woof! right the last couple of years it's kind of really gone from strength to strength for her she's really been successful she kind of popped off she's done her fashion she's got a record label she's done a few remixes played in a million places and in general she's been okay right everything's been great in terms of a profession her career but i guess in terms of sentiment in the scene in terms of her perception how she's perceived what people think of her the gossip on the forums in the comments and all that sort it's been a bit indifferent it's been a bit weird it's been a bit topsy-turvy one minute she's everyone's friend next, next minute she is the pariah that is essentially ruining this beautiful thing that we call electronic music me I'm, I'm not too sure i fall somewhere in the middle i think she's well and you know i've always been of the thinking anywhere i've said this to my friend plenty of times that i don't necessarily think she's a dj i, I look at her more so as an influencer first then somebody happens to dj and happens to do fashion i think for the most part she strikes me as somebody who was very much infatuated with the scene, dance music scene. I think if you've been to festivals, you've been to club nights and you've seen the kind of cool guys and girls that hang around behind DJ booths and have hugs and stuff and, you know, do the whole air kisses and just hang around and they always happen to have VIP spots and they always happen to be posting about with this producer, that DJ. It seems like a fun place to be, right? And if you get involved in it, and you and you hang around long enough, I'm sure you will end up picking up the love for the music, end up picking up having some courage to get behind the decks. And then over time, because you've got the access to these amazing people, um, you might have the opportunity to play in some great clubs, right? Especially if you've got the talent to make music. Because the one thing people overlook about Peggy Goo is that she's a classically trained pianist or whatever it may be called, right? Because she's basically she's Asian and she comes from money. So they, you know, they kind of that's a thing that you kind of expect from somebody that comes from that kind of affluent well-to-do educated background that their parents you know put them into some kind of piano uh violin class or whatever it may be called right which is at the time probably something a bit cringy a bit annoying and something that you probably wouldn't have had that much enjoyment for especially when you're heading into your teenage years and your mom's forcing you to you know play fucking pharaoh jacker but as you grow up and you get into flipping electronic music suddenly all these skills that you've learned from actually knowing music theory you, you're gonna 
making electronic music is going to be an absolute cincher. I'm sure she could probably close her eyes and make 10 EPs in a night if she wanted to, right? It's not hard. So I think a, a combination of her looks, you know, she's an attractive woman, a combination of her fashion sense and how she puts stuff together, a combination of her love for the music and her just being a great person. It seems that to hang around and people seem to actually like her as a person and a combination of just, you know, the fact that she's got the skills, the actual talent to do something, I'm not surprised she's able to get where she's got to. But I think some people look at it like a, you know, like a, a story of privilege. I look at it as a story of circumstance, a story of kind of, it's, I think in general to be successful in life, has to be, it's like a confluence of things, right? It's like loads of things happening at the same time and then they sort of meet at the same time, at the same moment and suddenly, boom, you blow up. But I don't necessarily think it's one thing. I don't, I don't think you can just get somewhere in life just for, by who you know or by whatever it may be. I don't think that is it. It's not singular. It's always loads of things happening at the same time. And then it's up to you to kind of seize the opportunity and go for the next thing. But again, loads of negative segment behind it. So she kind of touched upon that on this interview here with ID Magazine, which I thought was very illuminating because again, I think it backs up my claim that I don't necessarily think she's a D. I don't necessarily look at her as a DJ in terms of like the purest sense of the word. And again, I don't mean a DJ purist as in like, I want her to be broken and you're playing underground parties for 200 people. I mean, just in terms of like, she doesn't necessarily, her actions don't necessarily look like somebody, she, she doesn't, she doesn't go about things in the same way like a Dixon would, right? Or like a Harvey would, or like a Ricardo Villalobos. She doesn't necessarily do that, or like a Seth Struxer. She's not that, you know what I mean? It's a different sort of vibe. And again, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing, right? You look at how successful someone like an Emily Lenz has been and she's kind of essentially, I would say she's transitioned a bit from like being an influencer to being more so a DJ DJ. I think she probably had loads of opportunities to really dabble into her kind of fashion pedigree, which, you know, she was a runway model, a legit runway model. So she could easily have kind of leaned into it. But she seems to really have taken her time to really dedicate herself to only playing in clubs and festivals. She's kind of fucked off everything else for the most part. I only see her wearing merch, back, like t-shirts that she designs. I don't necessarily see her wearing fashiony items for the most part behind her decks. I think someone like Nastia probably wears more fashion things than her. So you can see what you can see people's actions and what they and then you can necessarily by by DJ's actions, you should be able to make an assumption about what they want to do in the future or where they want to be position wise. And for me, it looks like for the most part, Peggy Goo came into the scene more so for a cash grab, right? More so to kind of you know get her kind of boost her clout or notoriety, and then kind of you know go from there. Again, maybe she developed a love for DJing over time, but I think mostly it was more so an influencer thing, and then it kind of went where it went in it. And this interview kind of says. Uh, basically agrees with what I, my assertion from the first point. So, Pegu discusses her online criticism and her, her resolution for 2020. This is an article from ID. Again, if you listen via the audio podcast, I'll link it in the show notes below. Um, it says the following. Peggy Goo had a busy 2019. On top of playing uh, close to 100 gigs the world over, the South Korean DJ producer and now fashion designer known as known for her popular Instagram accounts as sophisticated deep house sets. She never fails to deliver. Recently launched her own record label and streetwear line, right? So a lot for a DJ. So on top of having 100 sets in one year, which is a nutty amount because you have to imagine, right? I think I did like, I think I must have played like, let's say I played like 52 sets in a year, right? That's fifty. That's one one a week. But that's mostly in London. That's mostly, if, essentially, all of them were in London. But imagine playing fifty two sets in a year, and you're traveling between different time zones, different continents. You know, late at night. Sometimes you might play until four at one place, then take the red eye, the first flight out in the morning to go play a festival in the afternoon. So it's a it's a really insane schedule. But it also puts into perspective how somebody like a Dixon. Remember when he got voted, you know, RA DJ four times in a year. I think he mentioned something like he wants to take his DJing sets down to 100. So they were above 100 before, which is just nutty to think of. You're playing more than 100 sets in one year. It's just really, really crazy. Especially because most of the DJs that do that sort of stuff, for the most part, they also produce or they also make remixes and edits. So the thing that actually got you all the sets, the thing that allowed you to kind of travel the world, you're now not able to do because you're playing so often. But then again, if you're a DJ, you don't want to say no to sets. You don't want to say no to gigs because you don't know if that's ever going to come back around again, right? Um, especially on the come up. I know for me, you know, playing in bars and pubs and stuff, it's so hard just to get regular sets to play around, especially in a, in a, you know, in like a fairly cosmopolitan city like London, where you know every other person you know is a DJ or photographer. It's very difficult to get gigs or to get slots to play anywhere. 
So the fact that you get something, you don't want to let that go, right? But sometimes being able to concentrate on the artistry side of things or the craft or falling in love back with the music is really important. That's why you saw someone like a Dixon say, you know what? No, no, I can't sustain this level of, you know, playing, especially with a young family and stuff. I think paying you, if you're young and you don't have kids, or you don't have a dependent or anything, it's probably easy to do. But still, like on top of the streetwear line, the flipping, you know, record label, which you could probably run for your laptop, is not too bad. But still, it must be a lot to kind of juggle. So she says the following. I enjoy it also. I enjoy it so much that I forget I'm tired, she says, laughing, right? Same sort of thing you heard from Virgil and he had to take a break. So imagine that this might be the same sort of thing, but she might be a bit more on top of things than Virgil did but you know he had the same sort of thinking right I'll sleep when I'm tired and no you, you only sleep when you're dead sort of thing hustle 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 and it kind of came crashing down on him as well so you never know she might take that break as well because I think Sven Van does that right is it Bali too they have this resort in Bali they all go to all the DJs but anyway let's continue Bali's new Irma design hotel and cultural venue uh dressed in a silky short sleeve shirt and a sporty move the shorts the DJ turned designer looks suspiciously fresh for somebody who's up until the wee hours playing to a rowdy crowd of 3,000. The beachfront gig, uh, whose promotional posters plastered across the island, read Goo New Year, which I love that actually. I love all their merch, it's really cool. Um, coincided with the drop of a new capture collection made in collaboration with an Indonesian, Indonesian hospitality group, right? But 2020 is going to be more low key for the overachieving music sensation who plans to cut down the live shows to focus on her first album, as I mentioned. It makes sense, right? She needs to, that's the thing that got her to dance. I really do think maybe, again, I, I say she's an influencer first, but I think she could probably be a even bigger act if she ended up really taking her live act to the next level, like the singing stuff and stage shows. That would be nutty. Is she really kind of lead into that? Because it seems that like she's got a lot more confidence and courage in doing a live show than others. I think Nina Kravitz did it at Coachella, but I don't think she's, she seems like she's a bit shy about performing in that sense live. So it'd be cool to see what Peggy Goo does in the future with that kind of live performance. Maybe a piano, going back to her roots, maybe a live orchestra, live orchestra, maybe some sort of theatrical thing. I don't know. There's a lot of things to do in that kind of field. And I think, again, she probably could end up being a bigger star as a live act than she is a DJ, which, you know, sounds nutty now, but stranger things have happened. So crave people, she said here, crave people need uh, to do nothing to be craved, she says. Uh, before telling me about the new home studio she's having built in her adopted city of Berlin. The LP follows an eclectic uh, score of dance music EP she sometimes refers to as K-House, released in 2016, as well as recent DJ Kicks Mix. The album, however, will be released by XR Records, which is flipping amazing. Uh, Peggy Goo's dream label, who she remembers emailing obsessively back in Korea to ask about internship opportunities and never once got a reply, which is great, isn't it? Full circle, imagine. You're flipping emailing, uh, you know, EXO recordings day in, week out, week in, week out, not getting a reply. And suddenly now they're asking you to release your album on their label. Amazing, amazing. And again, for, there's, you know, there's a lot, lot to be said about labels being shitty and, you know, doing wrong by artists. But EXO Records is still one of the record labels you hear people speaking about in glowing terms. Whenever you see someone wearing a bomber jacket of EXO, you're like, wow, is that person signed? Do I know them? Can I get your info and shit, right? You're, you're just, intri- they're just, there's so much brand value in that fucking logo. They stand for so much cool and quality music that like you're just in really good company releasing on it. So it must be a real dream come true in that regard. That's, I think, some of her merch there she's wearing. Um, alongside this, a 29 year old DJ, which uh, I'm surprised she's that old. I didn't know she was that old. I thought she was younger than that, actually, concerning her accent. But hey, what do I know? We'll continue to grow her record label, Gudu. So far, the project has acted as a platform to support the work of cult yet overlooked electronic producers from Reflex Records, DMX crew to American remix Mavericks, Maurice Fulton. Some of my legends, she says, who I think deserve more spotlight. Amazing, right? Somebody new in the game, somebody relatively young, fresh, with all the hype around her, using her platform to boost other people up. You cannot hate that, right? Cool. But ultimately, the powerhouse happens to, um, hopes to sign emerging talents, particularly female and Asian musicians, which is great. Um, someone like Peach will be cool for that, that record label, but I'm sure she's already wrapped up. I went through a lot after I signed my first uh, music, she says, remembering the lack of support she received from her first label. This early experience encouraged her to change the game. I want to give artists what they want, which is great, isn't it? An artist is always more attuned to what another artist need it can sometimes be a bit difficult signing to another, another artist record label but she manages it in the right way has people in place who can kind of help manage it it should be good it continues here while peggy is best known for her music career now gathering crowds uh now gathering crowds in thousands at international clubs and festivals alike the first love was fashion 
after spending her teenage years in London, her parents sent her to English. They sent her to, they sent her to earn, learn English because they thought I had no future in South Korea. She applied to London College of Fashion, st- started a course in styling. I realized I wasn't good at it. She says, who barely worked as a, who briefly worked as a crush burner of Harper's Bizarre Career. I really enjoy styling myself. She loves. Uh, this start, so I think this is part of the reason people don't like her, right? The fact that her parents are rich and they sent her off to London to go learn English. But, you know, you can't help the family you're born into, innit? It is what it is. And I think sometimes, you know, there's a lot. I think the kind of affluent thing, dig, is not really fair. People are born into families they're born into. They can't do nothing about it. And I sometimes think the fact that somebody rich or somebody that's got all the means to just live life and get, you know, have essentially a trust fund and not do much, the fact that they go out there and try and make something of themselves, I think... You should, it, it should have, you should be able to, I don't know, some, you should put more respect on their name if they're rich and they actually went out there and bust their ass and make something of themselves. Because you have no reason to, right? Most of the motivation that we have in life, I, I can only speak for myself being a man, is to, you know, attract women and to somehow, you know, not to live the life of poverty that you had when you were younger, right? That's sometimes something that will drive you. The fact that we were, especially myself, growing up in such a poor household, it's driven me to be this determined, this entrepreneurial, to have all these goals, all these aspirations that I want in my life. Is because I came from such, you know, humble beginnings. So most people, that's what it is, right? That's that's where the term rags of riches story comes from. But if you're somebody that's, you know, has all the resources, all the connections, all the money, you, know, you don't have that stress of waking up not knowing where your next paycheck's going to come from. Um, to have the motivation to put yourself out there as an electronic music artist or a DJ. And again, there's only so much your friends can do for her. I think, you know, you might get an in, you might get an intro to kind of have a couple of sets. You know, you might get brought in to play a couple of sets in a couple of cool clubs. But if you're not good, you just won't get invited back again. So I think the fact that she gets invited back again, gets booked, her records get picked up by big record labels. And, you know, she's got a big fan base. It goes to show that she's obviously good at what she does, isn't it? So I don't think the rich thing is fair is a fair insult was a fair critique um but again uh, it carries on here but this day in fashion wasn't all in vain last year following a series of timely encounters with louis vuitton artistic director virgil abloh um peggy Gu launched a women's streetwear label karen giraffe in um, korean her favorite animal backed by off-white uh, parent organization italian company new guards group which is which uh, recently acquired uh, by farfetch which is great in it great for her i mean if you're a dj and someone like a new guards group can come in and handle the production and all that sort of stuff and you just have to kind of maybe approve designs or lend your you know your kind of expert eye on things that's great because you know the fact of imagine she was trying to run her own shopify whilst being a dj that's just going to be super impossible to do you need a whole team to kind of manage that thing for you but the fact that they've got like a whole studio in milan that she can kind of go in drop in kind of lend her ear to do some design send some stuff off into a whatsapp group like virgil does i think it's a great uh, situation for her in general right awesome and of course it allows new guards group an entry into that kind of world and i won't be surprised if you see new guards group doing something similar with a brand like innovision or something going forward that'd be pretty cool to see or even like a dover street market i can imagine like a comme des garçons kind of buying into innovision and kind of helping them do production same way they helped out with um ah so many other brands i've got the name of it anyway continue on um these references appear as much in her design aesthetic as a visual identity of a musical universe whether it can be the reoccurring motif of the whether that word is across her designs or the traditional mask interpreted by illustrator G. Jiok Chow for Gudu's logo, Korean culture remains a strong source of inspiration for Peggy. She says, I always try not to lose a link between Korea and myself. She says, recounting how she cried during her last gig in Seoul after the year started to sing along to her Korean language track, Starry Nights. Oh my God, she says, I'm getting goosebumps. She says, getting excited, which apparently in Bali is a good sign. The song... Coincided music video was directed by Pegu's boyfriend, a German-born photographer, uh, Jonas Lindstrom, also responsible for co-directing um, Kendrick Lamar's Element. It's an eerie tableau to contrasting South Korean landscapes from city to back streets to terrible mountain lakes. But here's a... Yeah, so here's a bit that gets me... that This is the main part of it. So, when I asked her about a recent gig in Saudi Arabia's controversial MDL Beast Festival, Pegu looks hesitant. Now, if you're not familiar with this, so the big outrage behind this, she went to go play at some festival in Saudi Arabia. Obviously, I was kicking up a fuss because Saudi Arabia's human rights policies aren't the best. Um, and somebody that kind of takes, you know, she kind of talks a lot about social political things, but then when it comes to her pocket, it seems like she doesn't give a fuck. And I always said from the beginning, I said from my friends, said to everybody that listened to me, that again, I, I think she's proven with her actions that she's just she really is about the paper if you have money you have to book her to play somewhere she'll play anywhere for you which is again 
not a slight, it's not a negative, it's just where you position yourself as a DJ. You have to decide when you're going, when you're coming up, I think, I think in any entertainment industry or any entertainment field, there comes a point where you have to decide where you want to go, what route you want to take. And there is only one, it's only, it's either or. There isn't, you can't do both. You can't be both a purist and also appeal to the, you know, the of the kind of commercial entities. Because that's why I'm surprised that she hasn't played at Tomorrowland or something like that. Honestly, I'm very surprised because she seems like anywhere that will cut her a check, she would go and play. So I think in terms of her brand, in terms of her sentiment online, again, she probably doesn't care and it probably doesn't affect her at all. But I think if I was part of her team, I would have probably advised against the Saudi Arabia thing just because I think already there is kind of a, kind of a big, not big, but like a small vocal minority of people on social who have a lot to say about Peggy Goo, right? They have a lot to say about her, which is interesting because she's a woman of, she's like a POC, right? As a, what people on social media like to say, she's a person of color, she's a female and she DJs, right? So it's a, it's a really male oriented space, but yet the fact that she's rich and the fact that she obviously doesn't care about, you know, where she goes and plays, it really is at odds with all the people that are woke on social media. Maybe because she's attractive and she's skinny I don't know. It's really interesting to see from the outside just how much hate she gets from other women, right, in the scene. Other people who are also people of color, also people that should be maybe riding with her just because, you know, from, I don't know, race relations, solidarity. It's very interesting to see. Um, anyway, it continues. Um, Since drawing a close to the festival in Saudi Arabia, uh, the inauguration of the three day music festival, reportedly organized by Saudi Entertainment Authority, has been under fire in Washington Post opinion writer Karen Atia. Model Teddy Qualivan and Instagram account Diet Prada are among those accusing high-profile attendees visibly paid to post flattering content about the experience in Riyadh or partaking in a PR campaign to rehabilitate the kingdom's image in light of recent human rights abuses, including the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, which goes to show, for the most part, people are full of S, right? We know this. Most people that would have been outraged about the whole Jamal Khashoggi killing Essentially, this people it's alleged that somebody from the Saudi government cut this guy's body up into different pieces because he had something disparaging to say about the Saudi government. They probably had a lot to say about that and were up in arms. But the moment the Saudi government, the Saudi entertainment arm um, puts, you know, wires through the money to your account. No, like, you know, they don't do split payments. They hide they wire the entire amount to your account. Direct deposit. It's available in your account straight away. Your Monzo goes ping. You just got a hundred thousand, you just got a million to play this flipping festival in the middle of Riyadh, you get flown into a private jet, you get a private suite, all this stuff, suddenly all those politics go woof, out of the window. So I'm not I'm not surprised. Most people are full of S, right? It takes a real it takes it's a it takes a person with real character, with a real moral backbone, um, that has principle to really stand there and say, you know what, I'm gonna say no. And also not to make a big fuss of it, because I'm not a fan of people that say no and retweet their no's, right? put a screenshot of the email they send rejecting this uh, plea to go play in Riyadh. No, just stand by your morals, stand by your principles. Your fans should know where you lie or what position you take on certain issues. And you just say, no, you keep, your, keep it moving. You don't make a big deal out of it. But I'm sure if Peggy would have said no to it, she would have probably, you know, retweeted an image or shared a flipping Instagram story of her kind of writing the email out on the computer. But again, I think for her, for herself, I just get the, imp- I just get the impression she doesn't care. She's in it for the money, in it for the clout, in it for the fame, in it for the exposure, the access it gets her, you know, obviously in the fashion realm. She gets to be in fashion without being in fashion, which is amazing luxury to have. I'm sure most of my fashion friends who are out there in the scene know how hard it is to kind of get any inroads in that industry. The amount of ass kissing you have to do is just nauseating. So the fact that she's able to kind of dip in and out is a great place to be but again i'm not surprised at her actions really i think people online complaining about it don't aren't necessarily that aware of what she does um outside of those kind of things but it continues here what she say here she says uh, <laughs> this is the best thing a lot of people out she says you know what peggy Goose says eventually i'm going to talk about it um having shared a lineup with the likes of david getter and steve Aoki, imagine being peggy Goose team and thinking this is a good idea again maybe everyone got paid to again agent managers everyone's getting a 10 percent, so it might work out better but Come on, man. Someone has to think of her long-term future. Why is she playing alongside Steve Aoki and David Guetta in the middle of flipping Saudi Arabia? Why is she doing that? She's only 29 years old. She's got so much. She's got so much to do in the electronic music scene. Why would you damage your career or damage your appeal or your take or your ruin your rep or your I don't know how you are viewed because imagine what other DJs must think talking behind a water cooler. But again, maybe other DJs might want to to play there too. I don't know, but. Um, she um, deplores the storm of online criticism she received, which people called her a sellout, which I wouldn't say she's a sellout. I'll just say she probably doesn't 
I don't know. You can't go. You can't go around picking up bottles on a beach, talking about global warming, and then go and play at Riyadh, right? Saudi Arabia. You can't really do that. It doesn't make sense, in it? I, I'm sure playing in Saudi Arabia cancels out the fact that you picked up bottles on a beach in Saudi Arabia. It doesn't. I don't know. What do you think? A on a beach in Bali? I would say so, right? But what do I know? Um, uh, shell out. Since posting a video from the festival to her 1.3 million followers, influences are different stories. She protests, highlighting the fact that she was the only female headliner at the festival, which she believes can help transform local music team, which is a preposterous thing to say. Like she's somehow because you're DJing somewhere and you're the headliner and your name is in bold on the top of a bit of paper, that somehow the Saudi government's going to be like, you know what, women should be driving too. Like what? <laughs> That's not going to happen. <laughs> what is she talking about? I went there to play music for fans. She says, right? Um, she clarifies. This may seem a reasonable position, but it isn't one shared by everybody. Just last summer, Nicki Minaj pulled out of a gig in Saudi Arabia's Jeddah World Festival over concerns about women's rights, LGBTQ rights, and the freedom to expression. A move endorsed by a New York-based Human Rights Foundation, but since previously facing backlash for cancelling a set at DGTO Tel Aviv, she had to apologise for the announcement she posted online. Self-described, naturally selective. She's not naturally selective. She plays everywhere. Peggy Gu explains that she has learned her lesson. Now it's preferring to stay out of politics. I don't, it doesn't matter if it's in Israel or North Korea, she concludes after admitting her Saudi stint involved a substantial paycheck. If there's people who want to hear my music, I will go. I don't give a fuck. Again, now we know what she stands and I'm happy with it. I think as a scene, if you don't like this woman, she has said here quite clearly, I don't give a fuck. If people pay me, if they cut the check, if the money goes into my account, my manager, my agent gets paid, I get a private jet, I get to post that picture of my foot up like that in the private jet, so you can clearly see I'm in a single seater. I don't care. That's what she's proven. So I don't see what the outrage is about. Again, for me, I wouldn't necessarily do this, but I think everyone's got, everyone's got, everyone's career is their own choice, their own journey, you know, people choose what they want to do. And if she wants to come in and do a cash grab and stuff, fair play to her, isn't it? She probably looks at it and thinks, you know what? What damage is it really going to do, right? If she ends up, you know, not being the most coolest DJ. And that's a problem, though, I think about her as well. Because a lot of her brand value is in how cool she is, right? And I don't think it's cool just selling yourself out like this, right? Standing next to a Porsche when you don't drive, right? Going to Saudi Arabia or wherever it may be cool to go play in a festival and profess how amazing Riyadh is, right? It's not really the cool thing to do. It's going to make you uncool to the people that are cool i would assume and once she's lost her cool factor what she do then of course there's an opportunity for her to be a you know an amazing live act or end up being a designer and take caring to the next level but i don't know man i think if i was an agent if i manager i would have said there's a long game here man you should be a bit careful about where you where you place her and who she's playing alongside like imagine she played like again this is me talking about miles i'm not sure if this is true but peggy Goo played in saudi arabia before she played in the lineup featuring charlotte the wit Amelia Lenz, Nina Kravitz, Helena Half, um, Dr. Rubenstein. Imagine seeing a lineup of all those killer women, female DJs playing in one place, right? It is some big promotion about it. The, the you know the women gonna take things to the next level. I don't know whatever you promote it as, right? She did a festival in Saudi Arabia before she did that, and I'm sure, I'm pretty sure there must be a stipulation or her agents or managers don't let her play alongside some of the other girls. Maybe you know you know how girls are. They can be a bit catty, so there might be some in. There might be some scene beef that I'm not aware of, but how can you play in Saudi Arabia before you go play alongside these amazing girls that are out here on the scene now? It doesn't make any sense, does it? It's crazy, man. But anyway, um, that's the interview on Thingy Majiggy. Um, there's loads of... There's more on here about her being a control fee, but definitely check it out. It's very illuminating. It's on ID Magazine. I'm going to link in the show notes. It's titled, Pay You Good, discusses online criticism and a resolution for 2020. Again, if you're a fan of hers, if you're somebody that's intrigued by her career and how much hate she gets or love she gets online, definitely recommend check it out. And again, if you're not a fan of her, she's told you already what her position is. She doesn't care. She's in it for the cash and she's going to keep it moving, isn't it? So you guys need to keep it moving too. Um, next on the list, what else do we have here? Ba, 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 ba. What else we go for here? What else is good? Oh, the Kim Kardashian fridge. That was a weird one, isn't it? Why did everyone get up in arms about that? Do you remember that? That was a little story from a couple of weeks ago. Um, Kim Kardashian posts a video, I think, of her kitchen and takes a little, you know, fridge tour and all that stuff and look into her pantry. And again, I'm not sure if it's social media or if it's just me or whatever it maybe is, or maybe it's just a vocal minority. But why do people... Why are people so shocked when one percenters do one percent of stuff? 
right? When the people who are providing the world of entertainment, right? Um, and whatever it may be called, whether it's through reality TV shows, whether it's through what they wear on a red carpet, why are they surprised these people who get paid to look good on camera or to look good in front of a camera lens day in, day out? That's essentially their 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 job is to look good and to stir up controversy. Why are they surprised when A, they stir up controversy and B, when they do things to ensure that they can wear the clothes that you guys wanted to see them in when they stand in front of a camera. I'm not surprised that Kim would open up a fridge and show me a fridge full of, you know, fresh vegetables, hardly any processed food, nothing in wrap, nothing wrapped in plastic or cardboard, right? I'm surprised it's pretty bare. It's like a, it's like a fridge of somebody that actually makes their own munch. If you've been to someone's house who actually cooks, you would see similar sort of stuff, right? You'd see vegetables, you'd see some meats maybe if they, if they do eat meat. You see some dairy stuff, so maybe some healthy fats, some grains. You see a section of food that looks like, okay, this person puts stuff together. They don't just buy stuff in a box and just put it in the oven or put it in the microwave. So this is a little video from Kim. He uploaded it on her Instagram stories. And again, I'm not too sure what the beef is. I really don't get it. Come um, to my pants. She's a multi-millionaire, maybe a billionaire, I'd say, for that, for that regard. So she's going like through, let me stuff. just quickly pause it. She's going through all her stuff that she kind of has in the, in the kitchen. And people are freaking out about it. I really don't know. I think someone mentioned something in the comments that, which again shows how fat you are if you're mentioning this in the comments. Someone said, oh, um, the, what does she air? What does she eat? Air or something? It's like, mm, that means you're a fat piece of, you know, S. That means you buy, you know, multi-pack of biscuits and stuff. Because if you don't think this is food, then I worry to see what, then I kind of dread to see what your kind of kitchen looks like. But yeah, this is quickly just let, check the video out. My pantry. I, have, I got rid of all my plastic, so it's all like glass jars. Nice. Patch is lovely. Sprinkles. I love the arrangements too. Frozen yogurt. Some sprinkles for yogurt. Ooh, lovely. So you come... In the pantry, all there is is the frozen yogurt machine. Oh, great. That's awesome. And so all the little frozen yogurt is healthier than ice cream, I'm assuming, right? That's why a lot of people eat it, I'm assuming, right? It, again, I'm not really a fan of the taste because I'm not a big yogurt eater, but I'm sure that's why. There's less fat in, or there's less calories and stuff in frozen yogurt. Or maybe just people prefer the consistency of it to ice cream. I don't know. But again, all good. Freezer, and then I got rid of all plastic bottles. Okay, so I just that's have cool. again, this. She doesn't need to do this. She's Kim Kardashian. If she has a, a fridge full of plastic, then you can go and suck her left toe. She doesn't care. But the fact that she's made the effort to get rid of it all and have it, again, I just love the organization. I love how OCD is. This, this goes to show, again, because I think people underestimate just how much how much work it must take to be Kim, right? To constantly care about your appearance and to work out and to eat a certain way. It must be exhausting. But again, it goes to show part of her personality because somebody that takes pride in the way her bottles are lined up and that all the logos are facing a certain way is also going to make sure they're eating chicken and broccoli every day to keep, you know, make sure their t tummy is flat so they can fit into vintage Mugler. Right now, this is just my drink fridge. All my awesome. kids use a different kind of milk, you guys. Okay. My fresh juices, fresh You guys! Water. <laughs> fresh that's juice. That's in this fridge. However. That's it? Let me show you something. But again, that's a lot of food. There's loads of, I saw loads of grains. I saw loads of sprinkles for frozen yogurt. I saw stuff for like porridge and whatever it means, natural oats, different sort of milks. Um, I saw loads of water. So, you know, everyone's hydrated there. No fizzy drinks, which is great. So the kids aren't bouncing off the walls if they already are. Awesome. Easy slides this on. This is nice. the kitchen. There's a kitchen. Where it all happens. Lovely. Say hi, Marina. Massive island. Look, this and is a kitchen from a guys, restaurant, isn't it? I have walk in walk in refrigerator uh -huh. where and again what's the beef with this we keep all of our fresh organic produce of course we like are building and stuff? on the property uh -huh. all organic trees to grow our own vegetables and do all our own stuff we'll so this farming. So again, I don't meals. really get the beef with this. I don't get you it. You guys know I eat plant-based now. Plant-based diet. So nice. all of our stuff is in here. So it did look like an empty refrigerator. Because it's really there. Then I took there. the photo in front cool, of it. I have to like admit. It's something the refrigerator you'd see in a restaurant, isn't it? And again, that's that's one percent of life, isn't it? They they they're essentially the American royal family. I'm, surpri I'm surprised that people are surprised that they have a you know a refrigerator that looks like this. Like, if you're a Kim, how are you going to fit into outfits if you eat, like, you know, in and out every day? That's not going to happen. 
Um, it has to be like this. It has to be this way. So again, I was I was surprised at the outrage online, but maybe it was again I was only listening to the minority of people who get pissed off about anything. But I think it's quite a cool video. I think again goes to show just how much work goes into being a person like Kim Kardashian and like Kanye West family in general. Um, but yeah, cool to see man. Plant based diet getting promoted out there for the masses, and yeah, pretty decent, isn't it? Move on. Um, what else do we have here? I think, you know, we're about to end in it. It's an hour in, actually. Let's end it right there. I think it might be good if it's ending because I need to watch the match. So, the Texas English episode number 274, I think. This is it 274? Yeah, 274. Thanks again for tuning in. If you're watching via the YouTube app, uh, please uh, smash that like button. Click subscribe if you want to come back again for another episode of the show. Um, share this show with your friends. Leave me a comment. Tell me the, what you think of the, you know, the stuff I'm rambling about. Um, if you're listening via podcast app, leave me a five star review. Share it as well on your socials. Let people know what I'm talking about. Let people know it's fun and it's good times with that malarkey. And um, if you want to learn more about myself, find me on Instagram and my Twitter and stuff. Check out my website, agostinozinga.com. That's agostinozinga.com. All one word dot com. You can see in the description. Click on there. You get all the links to my socials, all the stuff about my DJ gigs, my blogs, all that good stuff. And again, I'll see you again another time on the show. Until then, take care, be safe, and make sure you cross when you cross the road. Look both ways. Yeah, cool. Peace. Bye.